Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and we are live. It's me, uh, Tamika Isaac Devine, um, and welcome to another segment of com Community Conversations with Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine. Um, it is a pleasure for you guys to, to be here. Um, we started this a few weeks ago in the midst of our stay home order in the middle of our pandemic uh, to bring you um, just information, interesting information that I think that we as a community need to have um, so that we can be making better choices, so that we can have educated conversations within our community, and really just to get some answers to questions that you may have. Um, and in light of this week being Teacher Appreciation Week, I told you guys yesterday I wanted to spend this week um, highlighting um, education, um, not just in our state, but nationally, because we all, <laughs> if we don't, if we didn't already have a great appreciation for, uh, for education, I know we all do have a better appreciation now that we've been uh, homeschooling uh, our kids as schools have been closed. And although a lot of states, um, particularly our state, is moving to opening up businesses back up and getting back to work, um, our schools are still closed, uh, which presents other unique challenges for us. Um, as parents, um, I am still working from home as I am schooling my 14, 9, and 3-year-old who uh, Beth just saw. He came up here wanting a banana and Fruit Loops at 1 o'clock. <laughs> so, you know, we got a lot going on here. Um, I, I'm looking down because, guys, I try and share this, but it's not letting me share it. So, anyway, I'll share it later. But thank you guys for who, who all is tuning in. Uh, happy Teacher Appreciation Week for those teachers who are here. And um, if you are here joining with us, you know, go ahead and, and shout us out so I know who's watching and who's here. And then make sure that you share this broadcast so that more po folks can hear this information and, and get part of the discussion. And if you are by any chance watching the replay, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, type um, replay in the comments. And if you have a question as we have a discussion and I don't get to it, I'll make sure that I go back and, and look at the replay comments and answer any questions. So anyway, with that said, I am excited because today um, we've been trying to do this for about a week or so, but it worked out really well um, that we were able to get this scheduled during Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, I have got with me an amazing um, guest today um, who's a wealth of information. Um, we've got Beth Branham Esquire. Uh, Beth is an attorney here um, in the Midlands area. Uh, but like me, in addition to having a law firm, she is also a public servant. She is an elected member of the Lexington Two School District. And she is the immediate past pres president of the National School Boards Association, which um, for those of you who might not understand, that's a that's a big deal. Um, you know, she, it's a big deal. She's the first. Correct me if I'm wrong, Beth. You're the first president from South Carolina. Is that correct? That's right. To make up. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, you know, a lot of um, organizations, you know, have umbrella national organizations and, you know, for us to have our local elected officials elevate to the level that they have the much respect and admiration among their peers nationally that they get elected to national office is is a big deal. And so Beth is just finishing up her term as the president of the National School Boards Association, the first president from South Carolina, um, which um, is a lot for us to be uh, very proud of. And Beth, I, I share with my colleagues on city council, it's really great. Most people don't realize it's like within the last three years, we have had Steve Benjamin, mayor of Columbia, has been president of U.S. Council of Mayors. You have been president of the National School Boards Association. And then starting in November or I guess 2021, Kathy Maynas from Lexington Town Council will be president of the National League of Cities. And so it's just really awesome to see how we've got our Midland elected folks um, who are, uh, are recognized and elevated to national elected positions um, and really showing leadership in our country. Um, because as we know, you know, all, all politics is local, but really us at the local level, we know and we hear every day what our constituency wants, what they need, and to be able to be a voice on a national level and share that information is awesome. And I, I want people to understand how big that is that the Midlands is represented that way. But anyway, after that big introduction, welcome, Beth, and thank you so much for being here. 
Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here today. I've been looking forward to coming on the show with you and sharing with you and just uh, miss actually seeing you and your great husband, Jamie, in person. Um, I know Tamika will not brag on Jamie, but Jamie is actually about to be our South Carolina School Boards Association president here in a couple of years. And he's been in our leadership chain for a while. And he's just such a phenomenal leader in his own right and serving us so well over there in Richland One. So you two are definitely the Richland County power couple is what I like to think of you as. But the bottom line is the other thing is they're both just super great people. They are just some of the nicest down to earth, most kind and compassionate people I've ever known. So I just appreciate everything that you and Jamie both do for our community to make up. Well, thank you. That's super sweet for you to say. And I finally got it right. So I'm sharing this post on my personal page as well. So we get we invite them over. So anyway, but I'm excited to have you here. Just um, first of all, before we get into some of the questions that we had submitted and um, I want to get into, first, let me ask you, how are you doing? I mean, like I said, you know, we're all, this is all a new normal for all of us. And, you know, you've just come off being president, but you're immediate past president, which means you still have roles and responsibilities. So you are an elected official, you're an attorney, you're in a national leadership role, um, but we're all operating under the stay at home orders. So you're, you know, working from home, although courthouses are, are pretty much cut, shut down, there's still a lot of work to be done for attorneys. So kind of how are you adjusting and how are you doing it all right this second? Well, to tell you the truth, Tamika, I probably have had more time in my office since the shutdown just because I was traveling so much um, with not, with NSBA. Um, our annual conference had to be canceled. So, you know, that took a week where I was going to be out of town and, and then suddenly I was now in town. Um, but, you know, I also my practice mainly I do family court. And the majority of my practice is garden at litem work, you know, helping with the children and the divorces and being that advocate for the children. So I really have tried um, hard to just stay in touch, um, learning all of these platforms like you're impressing me with this new one today. But, you know, learning how to do the Google Duo or I knew how to do the FaceTime, but the Zoom and, you know, really I've started checking in on my families and, and the children um, in the cases I have a lot more just because I know we're about to get into this um, school being out. But, you know, to me, as you've seen in the headlines, the, the reports of child abuse are way down, but we don't think that means that child abuse is way down. It's just that those people who normally would be reporting on that child abuse aren't actually laying eyes on the children. So that's been kind of a big concern with me in my case is just that, you know, I at least want to be able to eyeball these children and, and, and just try to keep keep tabs on them as much as we can. I know that a lot of our school districts, when they're out delivering the meals to the children and their families, they're at least putting some eyeballs on them there too. But, you know, the more we in our community can just try to keep an eye on our children, you know, th the better off we are. Because, you know, as you know, I, I, I still believe it takes a village to raise a child and we're responsible for all of our kids in Lexington and Richland County. So that's, you know, a big part of my practice. Yeah, um, that's one of the things we talked about that a little bit yesterday. My guest was um, Joanne Turnquist from um, uh, Central Carolina Community Foundation. We talked about Midland Skills, which is happening today. So those of you who are watching, if you haven't given to Midland Skills, you still have hours to give a $10 minimum donation and you can support some of our, our great organizations. Um, but our conversation with Joanne, uh, we talked about and, um, you know, I shared with her that, you know, although you know, the needs in our community are so great. And right now, while people are under stay at home orders, you are seeing things like um, domestic violence reports increasing, um, child abuse and neglect uh, um, reports decreasing. And it is, I think it, it doesn't mean that those situations um, have changed a whole lot other than the fact that, especially when, like you talked about with the kids, you don't have those, those folks who, you know, kids were able to leave the house and they were able to have people who could make a report and you don't have that right now. So that's, that's really, really important. So thank you what you do legally, because most people don't, and people ask me all the time, but people don't get it. I mean, as a, as an elected official, we are quote, part-time elected officials, but we really do work full-time um, to serve the public. But we got we don't get paid full time, so we got to make a living, and so it makes it difficult sometimes to do work. And when you're an attorney and you do stuff that helps people, especially helps families, um, there's a lot of demands on your time. So thank you for the community for for that part of your work as well. 
Um, so let me start first. Um, the first question I wanted to kind of, and this is, I'm um, to tell the, the, the people who are watching, I wanted Beth to start off. Let's start basic before we really get into the meat of the things that we wanted to talk about, because for me as an elected official and, you know, because I'm married to a school board member, I know that people uh, don't really always understand the role of their elected officials. They just think, you know, hey, you're over the schools and I'm going to call you about this, that, and the other. And that's really not always the case. So let's start a little bit basic. And can you just start off? Um, what is the role of an of a school board member? Because I don't know if people always understand. They don't, the school board members aren't responsible for the day-to-day -day that's going on in the classroom. So can you just share with us, what is the role of the school board member? And particularly um, as you elevated to the national level, um, what, what is your what was your role as the or, or as leadership of the National School Boards Association and how does that support the needs in our community? So to go to like just probably the most basic would be and you're right, I think our number one job and priority as elected school board members and elected officials is that we need to be the voice of our community and kind of the eyes and ears for our community, so to speak, for our administration. So to that end, uh, a lot of times we'll get grabbed in the grocery store or at a football game or wherever. And, you know, either a teacher gave a bad grade or did something different on a discipline matter than the parent thought or or just a variety of things, including, you know, the schools being shut down right now. Um, you know, we can even get blamed for that. But, you know, the truth of the matter is actually um, what we do is our job at that point is to take the parent and direct them up the chain of command. You know, uh, if I have a parent come to me with a complaint about a classroom, um, I certainly want to listen to them. Um, but we have to be careful too. parents don't understand how much we listen to them. So I immediately usually try to send them, hey, if your problem is within your local school, let's take it to your assistant principal. And then if you're not happy, go to your assistant principal. And if you're still not happy, you know, work them on up that district office chain. Because um, one, one of our functions is we really are kind of like the appellate court type Type function for to use our, our law terms, um, Tamika. But you know, so in general, if a, a student is coming up for an expulsion hearing, and a parent calls me up and says, "Hey, I need to tell you what happened. This happened. This happened," and they start giving me their entire side of the story, well, that's going to compromise me out potentially from being able to hear that parent come forward if they're going to fight for that expulsion or uh, you know a, a teacher termination thing. So, a lot of times as school board members, we don't like to, but we have to do cut people off from giving us too much information because we want to we want to keep that, you know, level playing field and make sure we're being equitable to all sides. So besides that, though, the majority of the time is your superintendent who's actually charged with the day to day operations of your district. You know, he or she, they're making the, the decisions. They're using their staff to push those decisions down. The school board really is framing our vision and our goal. And where do we want to go with our school district? Um, we're also charged with passing our budgets to fund our school districts. Now, there's different layers in different counties. Um, that, that have you know a little bit of differences, but for the most part, we're, we're using that um, we're using that to drive the decisions we want to be made in the school district in terms of education and all of that. So, really, day to day operations is the job of the superintendent, and then kind of more like the vision and, and the guiding of the district is the charge of the school board member. But we do like to hear people, and we do like to talk to them in the grocery store and the football field. Um, but we'll usually be quick to correct you and let you know if, hey, you know, that that really it wasn't our decision to make, but, you know, we're going to pass on what your opinion is on that. So that's kind of a short summary of the local. And if you want me to jump in straight into the NSBA. So as the president of NSBA, I was very blessed to be able to actually travel nationally to other state conferences. So like Jamie is going to be president of the South Carolina School Boards Association. So I would get to go to, like, let's say, the different uh, another state like the Wyoming School Boards Association or the Mass Massachusetts Association of School Committees. When they would have their annual conference for training, I would get to go and be a guest speaker for them and kind of give them things that I did. That's what's going on nationally um, with NSBA. We have three main things that we work on. We work on just that public advocacy of promoting public schools and why they're good and, and, and why we really are the cornerstone of our democracy. We have um, our our legal advocacy, which to make a people don't know this, but this will probably impress you as a lawyer that NSBA is quoted more in Supreme Court briefs by the Supreme Court justices than, than all the other education associations combined. 
that's a pretty big deal. So NSBA has a really, really good, uh, well-recognized name in, in the legal advocacy. And then, of course, we have um, our advocates on the Hill. We kind of see that we're the Washington office, so to speak, for our local school boards association board. So that's kind of a brief, but a little bit long summary of both of those answers, I think. Yeah, but it's such such important roles and, and we appreciate your role there. So let's jump into this because this is one of the biggest things I don't know if people really recognize. I mean, we're all dealing with a new normal. Um, and, you know, you guys have had, you know, schools closed. Um, you don't just educate the children. I mean, you really are responsible for the whole child. Um, so can you share with us what what um what what have been the biggest challenges um, that have been presented uh, as far as the governance of our schools um, through COVID-19. And, and you talked about the school board, y'all work the vision. Then what challenges does that present to you guys as school board members that trying to kind of move forward with the, the vision of moving forward our education system here in South Carolina? So we were really fortunate in Lexington, too, in that we were one of, I think, 13 test sites throughout the state of South Carolina, 13 test districts to roll out e-learning in the fall. So when we had, I think, I don't remember if it was a hurricane day off or a rain day off, but when we had that, we were already prepared to do a makeup day using the e-learning. So our teachers kind of had, you know, five to 10 days worth of plans prepared already heading into this crisis. So in some respects, we were a little bit ahead of the game. We were able to help neighboring districts of pushing out some ideas and lesson plans and how that worked. And we already had the one-to-one -one ratio of devices to students. So from that perspective, our district was really a little bit ahead of the game. Some of the challenges just from an e-learning standpoint were obviously getting internet to all of our students. Now we're lucky, we're just like you, you know, uh, West Columbia, Lexington, you know, seems suburban, but we really are urban, much like Columbia. There's only one river that separates my house and you, you know, <laughs> so we're right here with you. So, you know, our kids are lucky in that respect because that a lot of them did have some internet access, but not all did. And I think that's the biggest just gut-wrenching worry of school board members in every district in every county across this entire nation is what about these children who are going to be left behind? What about the children who are homeless? Or what about the children who are just living um, in poverty and don't have that internet access? So one of the first things a lot of us did, uh, Richland uh, one did it as well. You know, we rolled out buses that had internet capabilities on them and we parked them in different areas for different hours of the day around our, our district. You know, it just picking up with all of a sudden the delivery of meals to kids because some kids, those are the only meals they're getting all day. So we want to keep, you know, make sure that we're getting those meals out there. That was a big challenge. And then just from a governance standpoint, Tamika, and I've actually watched, um, I kind of learned from y'all because I started watching y'all's council meetings online just to see what was going to happen to us. Cause we had to actually uh, pass, um, an amended uh, board policy to allow us to do the online meeting, you know, because we, we want to live in the sunshine. We want to be open to all of our news media and our reporters and let the public know what's going on. But that's kind of hard when dealing with platforms that a lot of people aren't used to and never have had to deal with before. And then, of course, you know, the Zoom bombing that happened across the country and different things, just things we never would have thought about. So there were some governance issues that you know, we had to deal with. But for the most part, we're still up and running and we're still providing education. And to that end, I think we do need to give a shout out to those teachers. You know, like you said, it's teacher appreciation week. And I had, I had to laugh with some of my teacher friends because they're getting emails and they said, you know what, we're having a tough time sometimes. And they're really tough on the teachers right now to make up because they're just sad because like my sister, who's an assistant principal of instruction over at Brooklyn Casey, she said, you know, it was like a Friday when we got this message. And then, Monday school's out and I'm, I'm walking down empty halls and classrooms and, you know, people just picked up and left expecting to come back. So we didn't get to see our kids goodbye. We didn't get to hug them goodbye. They didn't get that end of the year, just burst of love you send kids out the door with for the summer. It was just all of a sudden a cutoff and teachers are really missing that type of connection. That's hard to do online. But I will tell you this, my teacher friends are telling me that they've never felt more appreciated by parents because a lot of parents are emailing them saying, hey, man, teachers are the bomb. I really appreciate you because I do not like being a teacher. I do not like doing this online learning at home and all of that. So I think that, you know, our teachers are being tremendous, just tremendous with the creative ways they've come up to keep in contact with their children and keeping education rolling along. 
They are. I mean, the, the innovation that I've seen among our teachers, I mean, my my baby school, she has, um, they have a school-wide Zoom meeting. And then actually she came up here right before I started with you because then she had to get the code for my email because then they have um, a, they have a book club. And so their book club has a Zoom meeting. And then she has a related arts where they do PE, Spanish, all the related arts are in one class. And so it's just been really interesting to see the way that in, the teachers have been very innovative um, after, after quote, spring break. Um, since they didn't get to go anywhere, one of her teachers had them all dress up like they would if they were going on spring break. So if they were going to the beach, they were supposed to wear beach stuff. And it was really kind of cool. And they talked about you know, if we would have gone to spring break, these are the things I would have done. And it was just really, it was really innovative. Um, so I, I love that. Um, so speaking of innovation from this, from the school board standpoint and, and administration, what kind of innovative things have you, um, have you guys um, had to kind of employ to keep in touch during this time? And do you think any of that stuff will stick and stand around, stay around even when we go back to school? You know, I really think and, and and maybe even worry that when we go back into school, it's going to look a lot different than what we, we left. And our teachers are just so creative and they're so dedicated. You know, nobody ever goes into education to get rich, so to speak. Um, and one thing that I think has really been an interesting, positive and, and upswing for our teachers is just the pressure like right now. Our children would be involved in the state standardized testing, high stakes testing, nerves just running out the roof from the teachers and the students and the principals and everybody. You know, springtime is also fun time getting ready for summer, getting to do your field days and all that. But right now it's kind of high, high stakes testing time. And just the relief, I think, from teachers when the testing requirements were, were dismissed for this year. And I know potentially even looking at into next year, because what it allowed our teachers found is so many of them said it allowed me to really concentrate on actually teaching my children and connecting with them on a different level rather than, hey, I've got to make sure you cover this standard, this standard, this standard. I mean, they're still learning. The children are still doing well and they're, you know, really advancing, but we're not having to teach to such a just such a high stakes situation that just made everybody so nervous with the testing requirements. So it'll be interesting to me to see what happens with the testing requirements for next year. I think that we probably, depending on how long um, this pandemic lasts and what it looks like on the second or third wave in the fall and in the winter, we may have to go on and off of, of online learning. I think that a lot of maybe remediation can start to happen through online learning because some, some places are doing it very well. And, you know, kids, I think, are enjoying and, and understanding this online technology and, and doing all this a lot better than probably some of the people my age. But, you know, <laughs> but they're OK with it. You know, and, and I've actually heard some teachers say, you know what, I have like certain kids who never would raise their hand in class, never would say anything, would just sit there really quiet. You never quite knew what they were thinking, but they have just blossomed in this online format. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see where we go with that. But I think maybe a lot of the remediation can be done through this and perhaps we still will have to do some instruction, you know, because we're going to have to continue to socially distance until, until we get the vaccine or, or, you know, some more people get it and all of that. So I have some, I have some big concerns about how school is going to look uh, opening up into the fall. So there's a lot that's going to be on the plates of school boards across the state and across the nation in trying to implement and helping the administration get the framework to implement whatever it is our state leaders are coming up with. And it's interesting because I, I um, read something about um, what this, what the new normal for education may mean. And um, it was an article, I think, in the New York Times or something, and they were talking about what it may mean for, yes, digital learning, but also classroom sizes and the way we deliver instruction, um, um, and, you know, the concerns that some of that brings is, you know, the infrastructure to support those things. You know, you're right. Some areas have that infrastructure. Some do not. And, and when you think about we're already challenged with our teachers and, and classroom size, you know, how are we going to be able to do that? Um, and then social distancing. If you don't have if you already, you know, we still have schools that have portables and things. And, you know, if you don't have the space already and then you've got to make, you know, 
make six feet, have the kids sit six feet apart, that's going to be really difficult. So I think it, it's teaching us a lot about um, being um, being able to adapt, but it also, I think, elevates. Um, I, heard, I heard a reporter say today that this pandemic is the great equalizer, but it's also the great magnifier. It magnifies a lot of deficiencies, you know, health disparities, um, deficiencies in our education system, deficiencies within our infrastructure. So it'll be real interesting to see what that means. Um, so what is it taught? What has this pandemic taught you about the way we educate our students? I mean, I, I know there's room for, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to change. Um, also, I think there's a lot of ways that we see how, you know, there's nothing like that personal contact. But for you who has seen things, not just on a local level, but on a national level, what has this taught you about the education in America and, and the way we deliver or provide education to our students? Well, first of all, I, I heard uh, a wise person once told me that there is no greater influence on any child in, in their educational year than their classroom teacher, their assigned classroom teacher. Just that that person who and I'm really looking into the elementary years, but that does go on up into the high school years. I think we can all think back about a teacher who just meant the world to us. But, you know, our teachers are, are, are where this whole thing will lie coming into the fall because they are so amazing, so creative, so willing to just do whatever it takes to allow their children to learn and to reach them where they are. You know, we had moved already to a bunch of individualized uh, learning and realizing that students learn in different ways and, and, you know, whether they're visual or verbal or whatever, but um, our teachers really were already moving towards a lot of project-based things and, and that, that would include smaller groups. And, you know, I, I think just going back into school in general, if you have a teacher there with a classroom of 24 st students and she's got eight hours and she's got to catch them up from last year from, for about a quarter and then she's got to get them, you know, moved ahead for the next school year. So do we divide her, her attention for, 20, you know, for 24 kids, eight hours, or do we take her attention and we go four hours with 12 kids and four hours with 12 kids? I think the one on one and the opportunity to have a closer relationship with that teacher and her attention or his attention not being so divided may be the way that we can get, get our students caught back up. But like you just said, Tamika, that is so strong what you're saying that for years we've been talking about the digital divide and that we need to do something about it across America. Every single state deals with those issues. But now that this has happened, it has just shown a glaring spotlight on how it really is just creates even greater equitable division amongst our children. You know, it, the haves and the have nots, the uh, rural and the urban. And, you know, it, it's time, I guess, now that the pandemic has shown us to quit talking about it and start doing something about it. And so I'm hopeful that that's going to be the next big push um, through our government is to really make sure that we get everyone connected. Um, because a lot of people who haven't been connected right now, you and I can sit here and talk like this. But what about people who don't have the Internet in, in their homes and, you know, are really lacking that face to face with anybody in that touch, whether it's a student or a relative or just a friend, you know, down the street. So I think that's going to be the biggest, the next big thing that we're going to say that we've got to deal with. Yeah. So what, what changes do you think might happen? I know you mentioned um, the testing, which I think that would be, I mean, we've talked about that for years as well, but I think that would be, if we come out of this and we find that kids really flourished. I mean, I, I'm sure there will be some that, you know, will need some remedial attention. But for the most part, if we find that the the, the challenges in the education hasn't been vastly different, do you think that we may go to instead of not so many standardized tests and going to really just educating on topics? And, and then after that, are there any other things that you think um, or have you heard the, on the national level that are being talked about that may be changes that we see to education based on what we learned during this pandemic? I think the question really kind of becomes our school buildings and what does our day look like and, and how, how will education look? And, and that actually, Tamika, is, is what the conversation is about right now. Where do we go from here? We know how important public education is. We know it's the great equalizer. We know it is the cornerstone of our democracy going all the way back to Jefferson. I mean, everybody understood the importance of having an educated public. And so 
you know, we know that we've got to come back and we've got to come back even better and even stronger than before. But the challenges are going to be, how does that look? How do we do it? Are we going to be tied to the agrarian calendar where we go to school from like August to May, you know, and have the summers off? Because I know the people down at the beach listening like to have, you know, the workers and all of that. But um, for right now, what, what's even going to be open in, in our state very much for tourism and all of that? So, you know, even possibly looking and kids start shuddering when you say year round school, but year round school incorporates a lot of breaks. It just doesn't throw them all like right in the middle of, you know, the summer. So I think that being able to divide up so we have smaller classrooms. I think that is going to be the greatest advance that comes out of this pandemic is that our children will go forward, hopefully in classrooms that are much smaller sized and much more geared toward what they individually need. And and I think we could come out better than ever, but it's going to take some challenges and we're going to have to look at some things like class hours and class time and, and other requirements that, you know, we've been required in our states, our state departments to have, and, you know, maybe even the Carnegie unit for high school students and things like that. But so many of our high school students already to me were doing online. We had a lot of dual enrollment and dual credit programs where you know, they were taking classes at Midlands Tech. And so there's just a lot of different things if we get creative that I think we can really come out really, really advanced. But I'm going to go back to it's going to take the infrastructure like you talked about. Because you can't do it and leave anybody else further behind just because they don't have the access to the internet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great point. Um, that's interesting. So let me ask you this: so it is again Teacher Appreciation Week, um, but not just our teachers. I mean, our teachers are a big part, but um, I love Richard One. I think y'all have one too, but Richard One has this great. Um, um, commercial that I saw where they were showing like every part of the system, the cafeteria worker, the bus driver. I mean, there's so many pieces of the system that are making things work. Um, you know, teacher appreciation isn't just about appreciating our teachers, but it, uh, appreciating everything within our school system. And I hate that, you know, it's a quote teacher appreciation day, but now that it, it, it is a week, but it really should be all the time. Um, and I think to that point, there, there are so many people who uh, want to, they, and even this has highlighted it, they want to support our schools, but they don't always know how. Um, what would you say to the community on how can we support public education, you know, uh, to, to the point of in, in SBA and what your role is, and, um, but also just our schools? I mean, what are some of the things that our community can do to show appreciation and support for our schools, recognizing that y'all deal with so much, not just, like I said, the education of the children, but dealing with, you know, are our children fed? Are they, you know, are they living on the streets? You know, do they have access to, to internet? So there's so many things that you guys have to deal with and you shouldn't have to be the only ones. How can the community support public education and specifically their local school districts? So I love that you just brought all that up because it is teacher appreciation, but we really, um, you know, it's educator appreciation because all of those people you talked about in our school systems, they're, they're part of that education process. They're part of educating our children. I I know that um, some of the SROs in the high schools are are some of the the best mentors for some of our most troubled students. They're in there educating them every day about life and uh, uh, our custodians taking personal interest in children's in their lives and asking them, you know, how they're doing. And, and I I love one story we had is that that, uh, the delivery, when they were delivering our meal, for one of our students at um, one of their drop-offs and the student came up and handed this letter and I think it actually went out on one of the local TV stations but the letter was a thank you note to the bus driver who was bringing him a meal every single day but the point in it you know we need to work a little bit on the grammar, but let's just say they were first grade. So it's phonetically spelled, though. We were getting there. You could at least <laughs> understand it. Okay? But, um, but the great thing about that is, is that this child just recognized that, hey, you not only show up and bring me some food, but you show up with a smile on your face and you just look happy to see me. So you're right. I got to stop there and just say we appreciate all of our people, you know, from from our custodians to our bus drivers. A lot of our bus drivers and, and our districts are actually have switch jobs now into going in and helping really deep clean a lot of our schools because we're trying to keep people paid and employed. And so they're doing a lot of jobs that they normally wouldn't have done, but you know, they're preparing and getting ready for their children too, to come back. So 
definitely that. So to that end, what I would say to get to your question is, um, you know, the one thing that I think that people most can do from a local level to a statewide level, county level, national level is to show that appreciation to those people in those school buildings. So, you know, parents, if you're listening and you have a, an assistant principal who really helped you out on an issue this year or a guidance counselor, just take that time right now. Well, after our show's over, of course, right, Tamika, but take this time right now and email that person and just say, hey, thank you. Thank you. Because those thank yous to teachers and educators and administrators and custodians and the bus driver, that goes so far for them. Because so many times we, everybody's rushing around so much, nobody stops to say thank you and that you're appreciated. And to me, I don't know if you know, I taught school for eight years. I taught high school English before I went to law school. And I still have some of those notes from parents or from some of my high school students. I've kept them. They're in a box. And, you know, I pull them out sometimes just to remember that feeling of, oh, my gosh, you know, I made a difference. And all of our teachers, like I said again, and our educators, Everybody working in the school system isn't in there to make money. They're not in there to make a, a ton of money because we just can't pay them what they're worth. But those thank yous are just worth tons of gold to them and gold to their hearts. So I think that's one thing that we could do. But not only that, on a national level, we need to be sharing our success stories. So when you have something going on really good, a really great program, like in, in one of your elementary schools in Richland one, we got to share that. You know, um, I think that Richland one does a really good job of putting out the, I saw the, the, their TV ad. It was phenomenal. And I love, love, loved it because we've got to share that. We've got to make sure that we are kind of controlling that conversation around what public education is because there are so many success stories and there are so many success stories that are going to continue to happen. And the one thing we can do better as public officials and school board members is to really help our districts do whatever it takes to promote our schools and also have our people in our community telling those good story, good stories. So if you're the president of your PTA, something great's happening at your school. You need to be telling your neighbors because your neighbors may not have children. They may just be getting a tax bill, you know, every year that they are wondering why I have all these school taxes on here and that's all they see. But if they hear you every day saying the great things going on for your kids and in their schools, then they might start to realize, hey, this is why we're paying those taxes and this is worth it because we're, they're doing some really good things in our district. So that's the biggest help anybody, any one person can do is number one, thank an educator today. And number two, start sharing the good stories in the success stories. That is so, that is so important. It's funny. I don't know if you watched the Today Show, but this morning, you know, they're doing stuff this week for teacher appreciation. And they were talking to a librarian who um, has done a Zoom with her students every day and she dresses up like a different character. And so the surprise was number one, Spirit Halloween um, gave her like 40 days worth of uh, costumes so she can keep it going through the summer. And then number two, the students actually dressed up and they social distance, but they did a parade in front of her house. Um, and and then talking about it, Craig Melvin, our, our local, um, our hometown boy, Craig Melvin, he teared up. And and um, and what he shared was, you know, being home, he's always appreciated teachers. His mom, Betty Melvin, who's a teacher, she's a, a, was just retired from original one. But um, his mom's an educator, so he said he's always had appreciation for teachers, but being home and seeing how his student, how his his kids miss their teachers, and not just the teachers, but everybody in the school, um, you know, it really gives him that light that, you know, his babies are, are so taken care of because they're they're so sad they miss the folks at school. So, so you're right. I mean, just telling those stories and, and knowing that you know, these teachers and the but the lunchroom, one, one of Jay's lunchroom ladies texts me, always checking on her, but the lunchroom ladies and the bus drivers and the custodians and even the ISS, you know, folks are, are instrumental to raising our, our leaders. And so we've got to tell those stories and let people know why um, that, you know, our system doesn't work without, you know, from the school board members and the superintendents all the way you know, through the whole system, our system doesn't work. We've got to appreciate everybody. So, Absolutely. so with that said, we are, we're rounding out. I don't see, I've just seen people say hi. So I haven't seen any questions <laughs> come through. Is there anything that I haven't asked you, Beth, that you think um, is important for the viewers to know? And I get a lot more folks who will, who will watch this afternoon once that they come home and relax and see the news, then they'll go 
go through and see um, our conversation. So I might get some questions later, but anything that I haven't asked you that um, that you want to make sure gets said so that it gets widely shared. Well, I just think conversations like this are important to begin you doing this outreach for the community and bringing in different voices because, you know, that's how we're going to make all of our communities better with your board members, your city council members, your county council members, everybody kind of working together towards the same goal. And I'll just tell you that, you know, I really um, and I'm not just telling you this because I like you, but I am I do like you. But I really was proud of the city of Columbia and, and the mayor and your council and some of the things early steps y'all took to really try to protect you know, the city, uh, especially since, like I said, I'm just right across the bridge. I can walk over into your city faster to a restaurant than I can in West Columbia. So, um, you know, love coming over there. But, yeah, you know, you really y'all took some hard, hard line decisions, which I think really were intended to help help people and, and help keep us all safe. So, you know, um, you know, every time we try to make a decision, sometimes we can get criticized. But there are a lot of people out there who appreciate, you know, what y'all have done. So please pass that on to your council. And, you know, I just think that all of us need to continue to work together with our municipalities and our council, our county councils and, and our school districts, because we all want the same thing. We're, we're all for making Columbia in the Columbia metropolitan area, the greatest place to live. And, you know, I uh, saw a statistic, you probably know the statistic better than me, but in Columbia, like the number four place in America for millennials to be moving, at least it was before this. You know, that's pretty cool because Columbia, there's been a lot of cool things happening in Columbia since, you know, you as a leader have taken over. I love Soda City. I know that we shouldn't be talking about things like we really want to be doing right now, but I mean, that just totally changed. And the changes that have come to downtown Main Street, Columbia, under y'all's leadership, it just really has sparked so much growth around the area, so much interest. And I just think that with millennials coming in and their energy and their ideas and, and, and their willingness to maybe look at some different methods of how we deliver education and, and what some changes that may have to come, I think that Columbia might end up being the number one place for everyone. So it is for me. And I thank you for everything that you and your council do and, and, and give my regards and my hugs to your husband, Jamie, who I love to pieces. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and I appreciate you and, and what you said is so true. And, and thank you for that for us, but for you guys as well, because I think especially as a parent, you know, yes, it is it is tough to have to work and and have three kids at home. Um, but I much rather than be home and be safe than us to make a decision to send them back to school just so, you know, parents can go back to work. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to balance the opening up of our economy and and the needs that all families have to, you know, to have, you know, economic resources. But we also got to make decisions that are in the best interest of our community. And I love this. I do have some. OK, so Michelle said this is a great conversation, especially on the subject of equity, access and advocacy in the era of COVID-19 in K-12 settings. I'd really appreciate your thoughts to facilitate a similar discussion in my area. Okay, I will be in touch. Definitely. We'll definitely do that. Um, and I can get you I can get some resources on that um, as well, because uh, in SBA, we have uh, our equity councils and we've been doing a lot of work in that area to support um, that And because it, it's been such a divide. And it is just like I said, it's gotten it's gotten really glaring and it's time for us to do something and quit talking about it. Yeah, it, it is. It is. So, and definitely. And we'll and we'll see it. Going again, like you said, there there might be a wave to come through of this thing, but you know we've got to figure out you know how do we move into stuff to support our kids and um, and then we've got to make the decisions that are tough decisions that are in the best interest of our children. So I thank you for what you do. Thank you so much, and I thank all of you who have tuned in today. Um, we're going to keep the conversation going. So tomorrow. Um, we will, um, I actually, tomorrow I have a social worker who will talk about social work, um, from the school district. Number one, how do we talk to our kids about what's going on? I mean, you know, I, it's been really interesting. Um, I think it's called flow, vocabulary or something, but they do like wraps of education things. And Jade has really got into that, but they have a whole thing on COVID-19. So they rap about washing your hands and what COVID-19 is and et cetera, and social distancing. So she's, she's really gotten into that. But, you know, how do you talk to your kids about why they can't go back to school, why they can't hang out with their friends and have a play date, why they can't go to the park? Um, but how do you have those conversations where you're not scaring them either? Um, and then how do you have the conversations around 
Uh, and then the other things that the social worker will talk about is these needs that these students still have that they're not getting because they're not in school. And how do we as a community recognize that? We do still have kids who are homeless. We have kids, you know, who have, uh, you know, um, educational challenges. And so how are we working for all that? So we'll have that tomorrow at one o'clock um, with uh, Crystal Green, who is a social worker. But um, until tomorrow, again, remember Midlands Give. So go ahead and, and support that. And until tomorrow at one o'clock, I look forward to seeing you guys. Thank you, everybody who tuned in. Make sure you share this conversation so the other folks can hear this great conversation and uh, give us their input as well. So until next time, I am Tamika Isaac Devine, your councilwoman, and you have been watching Community Conversations with Councilwoman Devine. It is definitely my pleasure. And you guys have a great afternoon and happy Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks, Tamika. Bye.